Hello, I'm Brian Patrick, and welcome to Fifth Third Business Beat for Friday, July 3rd, 2009. On the front page of the Business Courier this week, the man who's been Hamilton County's most senior advisor on developing the banks, 51-year-old Tom Gableman, is a partner at Vorey, Sater, Seymour & Pease. From his office on the 21st floor of the Atrium 2 building downtown, he can see the work that's being done on the banks, knowing he's had an impact on its progress. It's amazing to see something transform, really, from an area that was blighted um, for a number of years, very underdeveloped and to see it really transform and, and to be a part of that process um, under um, some very difficult circumstances. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a good thing to, it was, it's a very good thing to be involved in. Gableman has been involved in some aspect in all of the deals over the last decade to get the development going. His admirers say he was the spark that reignited the project after it seemed to have hit a wall. But his critics say Gableman's work slowed the progress and added to the cost. Hamilton County has paid Voorhees $16.5 million for its riverfront work since 1999. But Gableman estimates the firm has saved the county more than $50 million by structuring deals that limited construction overruns and minimized county payments for roads and other infrastructure. Delta Airlines' decision to cut its direct flights from Cincinnati to London and Frankfurt means some businesses will have to reduce their overseas travel. Delta made its announcement last month saying it's committed to reducing international capacity by 15 percent in September to ensure its long-term success. But business leaders here are so concerned the chamber sent a letter signed by dozens of executives asking Delta to cut back on the number of flights rather than cut them out altogether. The reduction in overseas flights among all U.S. carriers is translating to fewer non-stop flights, longer layovers, and in some cases, added stops between home and destination. A center that provides assistance to those in need is looking to diversify its sources of operating income. The Healing Center was opened a year ago by the Vineyard Community Church in Springdale. It occupies 60,000 square feet inside a 100,000 square foot warehouse bought by the church. It includes a marketplace which offers basic grocery items and other necessities for free. The warehouse is a free clothing store. The church pastor says it offers physical, spiritual and emotional help for those who need it. About three to four thousand people are being served each month and the church says that's too much for the vineyard alone to support. So the ongoing sustainability, it's a, it's a big, big project. Uh, our goal is to have uh, uh, the church provide about a third of the costs and then another third through uh, fundraising and different events that uh, we would hold here in other places and then another third would be through uh, hopefully corporate sponsorships and um, other monies that are available out there for this these types of projects. Vineyard sees about 6,000 people at its services each weekend and about seven million dollars a year in collections. Some local properties owned by a Utah development company are in such bad shape, the city has condemned two of them and is seeking bidders to demolish one of the homes. JD4 Investments says it bought the homes with the intention of renovating them, then reselling them or renting them. But residents like Josephine Howard are skeptical. This home sits next door to hers in Bond Hill. There are overgrown weeds, the paint is peeling, and the roof is in bad shape. Howard just completed renovating the inside of her home and is now working on restoring the brick on the outside. So that's why it's really important that we try to get this, this situation resolved with this, this, this property here. Um, it has been, uh, it's been becoming a nuisance to our community, not to mention the appearance of it. A general manager for JD4 says some of the properties were in very bad shape when they were purchased, but the company is doing its best to make repairs. In this week's Business Courier, reporter John Newberry has a story about how Kroger is seeing tremendous growth with some private label products. These aren't the products you'd expect. We're talking beer and wines here. How many beer brands does Kroger have of its own? Well, it's got uh, three, three labels, basically, which are these here. Um, this has a couple, like three different styles. This has a light version, but th basically three, three brands that uh, don't have Kroger anywhere on the label, though. So Kroger, I assume, is manufacturing this beer. Are any of these imported? Uh, two of them are imported. These are two imports. Kroger does not make the beers. They have them made for them by some third-party breweries. 
uh, and two are imported. This is made in upstate New York. Now, most people are pretty particular about the brand of beer that they drink. Are these selling very well? You know, it's hard to tell. They don't break out the numbers on these sales, basically. But if you look around the stores, you can kind of get an idea. And I don't think the beers are doing really great because it's kind of the availability is kind of spotty. Um, this Tap Room 21, I think, is in almost all Kroger stores. But these other two are hit, hit and miss. Um, how about Kroger Wines? How are they selling? Kroger Wines, now they, they like to talk about their wines. They say their wine sales are doing fantastic, uh, up dub, double digits um, these days. And they're, they just in, announced they increased. They added six more wine labels to their Kroger house brands, as they call them. Now, because of the labeling, it's hard to tell that these beers or the Kroger wines are Kroger brands. Give us some clues as to how you find that out. Well, the... Uh, the house wines, they actually have it on their web page, um, a list of their house wines, but there's also some little hints on the labels of some of them. One of them is called uh, Dillon Springs Road, another one has Old Vine Street on it, and Barney's Heritage Cuvee is on one, uh, one label. Now, Kroger is really putting a lot into promoting its wines, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's the, the wines, they've got these little uh, shelf extenders that stick on the front of the shelves, just hold a single bottle, and they've got all their house wines sticking out in front of their uh, wine shelves now. How about the, the connection between the success of these private label beers and wines with overall profits for the Kroger company? Well, um, I think it's adding to it. Profits have been increasing. They say if people are moving down to a lot of Kroger brands, you know, everything from uh, they make thousands of Kroger brands, and people are, with the economy slumping, people are moving down to uh, the cheaper products, and the beer and wines is going the same way, they say. Well, John, I know you've been covering beer for years here in the Tri-State. Thanks for all that good research. Okay. Sure. Be sure to read John Newberry's story in this week's Business Courier. Here's the Courier Greater Cincinnati Stock Index. We track the performance of about 40 local stocks compared with the broader market using the Dow Jones Wilshire 5000 Index. Stocks rallied last week. The local index gained about 5%, while the overall market rose around 4%. Watch Fifth Third Business Beat Fridays at 7.30 p.m. on CET or online anytime at CETConnect.org. The Business Courier, Greater Cincinnati's dominant provider of breaking business news. More than 50,000 readers each week depend on the Business Courier for information to help grow their businesses and stay ahead of the competition.